Salut Hello everyone, I'm Tina and I represent the Delhi chapter of OSS movement. Uh, with me today as host is also Saloni Shah. She's an architect and an urban planner by profession, uh, based out of Surat. And she is also an OSS ACE facilitator for our adult programs, including in many regions like Kashmir. And we also know her as you know, an inside out architect who not only creates award-winning spaces, but also transforms lives. So thank you so much everyone for joining us for our online dialogue series. And uh, it's called The Power of One. Your dreams matter if you dare to live. So through this session, you know, we see how one human being has the power to impact so many lives. Uh, we are exploring journeys of such people with the aim to inspire and sensitize the youth as well as the old of our country through their amazing life stories. So today is also our first Samarthya special which is the Women Empowerment Series, and uh, which we are doing through these Power of One sessions. And uh, we are very honored to have with us Shine Mistri, who is a true leader of girl and women empowerment. And we're all very excited to get to know her through her journey of life. Thank you so much, Shaheen, for joining us. But for the benefit of the youngsters who are listening, I'd like to give a brief introduction uh, for everyone. So be the change. It's such a simple phrase, but it has endless and infinite possibilities. Shaheen Mistri, uh, founder of Akanksha and the current CEO for Teach for India is an example of someone who had an experience that moved her at a very young age. She envisioned a, a powerful idea and pursued her vision with courage and passion, and now is a leader for transforming education in India. Her drive has been to better the lives of children who were born into underprivileged and disadvantaged backgrounds. Today, she has played a huge role impacting many lives of children through Teach for India. A huge believer in the fact that education goes much beyond the subjects that are taught. Shaheen has been fighting to see a future where quality education in India is not just a privilege, but a basic human right. Shaheen has given many underprivileged kids a chance to turn their lives around through education. Heartwarming welcome to you, Shaheen, from the entire Oasis family. Thank you once again for giving us your time. Thank you. So lovely to be here. Thank you. Yes. You know, we have so many students, youth volunteers, educators, facilitators in the audience today, you know, listening and going to be enjoying the session. So I'm sure that during our conversation, we are going to when we listen to you know, some of the brave choices you've made as a change maker, it will inspire all of us to continue on our own unconventional life path, you know, because some of us have chosen those who, and many of them are in the audience today. So that's what we are looking forward to today. Thank you so much. So before we begin, I just have a quick announcement for the audience. So request everybody to please keep their cameras on and mics on mute. And uh, we are going to have a question answer session as well at the end. So please reserve your questions till the end. Yeah, thank you so much. So uh, if we begin from the beginning, Shine, so we'd like to know how was the idea of Akanksha born in your heart? 
can you tell us a little bit about the Akanksha journey and you know the love for kids which you had, which prompted you to start the foundation and then later which led to the birth of TFI as well? Sorry, Tina, I missed your, missed your question. You broke out for a minute. Could you just- Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, so I'm gonna say, I just said that let's start from the very beginning. And uh, we want to know that how was the idea of Akanksha born and the love which you had for kids, which led you to form the foundation and then later, which led to the birth of Teach for India as well. Sure. Um, can you hear me? Can you hear me yes. well? Yes, we can. Okay, hear. great. So that's a, a big, big question. And, and my mind goes back many years. So I started Akanksha 30 years ago. Um, so a long time ago. Um, and I think really, of course, when you look back, you can connect so many seeds that were planted over so many years that led to the birth um, of Akanksha. Um, but I'll, I'll try and share a few of those with you. Um, I think the first was my own childhood growing up. I, I grew up in five different countries. I went to 10 different schools. I was in different school systems. Um, and every summer, um, me and my brother used to volunteer. And I did a lot of voluntary work with animals. And I did a lot of voluntary work with children. Um, and I think a lot of the seeds of eventually jumping in um, and starting Akanksha came, came from those experiences working directly with animals, directly with children. Small little things over, over our summer vacations. Um, so that was the first, I think. The second was um, my parents. And, and of course, our parents play such a huge role in shaping our lives. But mom was a speech therapist. Um, and, and worked with a lot of children, um, many of them who had speech um, disabilities, but also multiple disability. Um, and so we always had children in our home. And so I was able to see um, the power of a teacher on a child's life very, very early on. So a lot of these experiences, I think, came together. And when I was 18, um, I suddenly started questioning a lot. Um, what am I doing? Uh, why am I living at that time? I was in America. Um, why am I living in America? Um, what can I do here? Can I do more in my own country? Um, I knew uh, very early on that I loved children and that my joy and passion came from children. So in that way, I was very lucky to know that I wanted to work with children. Um, and so really the start of, of Akanksha happened because I was here uh, in India um, on a vacation and I was supposed to go back into my second year of college. I'd worked very hard to get into a good university in the U.S., um, and one day stopping at a traffic light, a few children ran to the window. And in that moment, I just questioned why, why not do something here? The need is so, so big here. And so really it was, you know, I saw your logo at the beginning, the Oasis heart and the beautiful video with the heart shaped um, uh, uh, people. Uh, it was a decision from the heart to say, let me just try and stay. And so, you know, my parents were back in the US. I called my dad very nervous uh, because I was booked to come back a week later um, and to, to rejoin college a week later. And I called him and I said, dad, I think I want to stay in India. And I'm not sure exactly what I want to do, but I want to do something. And I feel that whatever I do here, will be more meaningful than, than going back. Um, and so with that, I, I then of course had a huge responsibility on myself to figure out what I wanted to do. Um, and so I said, where, where can I actually start? Um, and for some reason, this idea came to my head that if I were to make friends with a journalist, 
I would get access to many different aspects of the city that I wouldn't otherwise be able to access. So I walked into the Times of India as an 18 year old, very uh, overconfident, uh, I think. And I said, you know, do you have any internships? And at that time, 30 years ago, they didn't have any formal internships. So they said no. So I said, well, you know, I, I really want to, I'll do anything. I want to work with a journalist. And so one journalist must have overheard strange young girl with a funny accent, even stranger at the time. Um, and he, his name was Rajiv. And, and he called me and he said, look, he said, it's not a formal internship, but if you want, I will allow you to shadow me. And through that, he took me into the high court. He took me into the jail system. He took me into the police stations. And he took me into the large urban slum communities. And when I went into um, the communities, I think I was just struck by, but I, I felt pulled to do something. Um, and so I just started. And this was, you know, pre, pre Akanksha. I just said, let me go and teach children. I'd never taught before. I didn't know how to be a teacher, but I would just sit down um, in the community. In I made friends with a, a girl. I, I didn't speak a word of Hindi at the time, and uh, she didn't speak a word of English. And so we spoke with a lot of a lot of smiles and a lot of gestures. And I sat in a home and I made that my first classroom. And a few kids ran in and I started teaching. And and so when people ask, how did Akanksha start? Actually, that moment of just sitting in a community myself with children, thinking back to my school days, trying to make learning fun uh, for children, that's really where it started. Um, and then post that, I went, I, at that time, I also then enrolled myself back um, into college in, in India. Um, and, and I would walk around, I was at St. Xavier's College in, in Mumbai, and I would walk around and I would be struck by so many young people sitting in the college canteen um, and not in class. And so I, I started asking them, I said, you know, India has so many problems, so many, like, you know, something um, uh, so would matter to all of us, whether it's the environment, whether it's the corruption, whether it's education. And so I asked a lot of people, I said, why aren't you doing anything? Why are you sitting around wasting your time in the canteen? Um, and, you know, almost every single person replied and they said, we want to do something. Um, and I was struck by that. And, and so then my logical next question was, well, then why aren't you doing something? And they said, because the problem's too big. How's it going to make a difference? You know, it's interesting. You, you, you said that the title of the series that you're talking about is the power of one. And so actually 30 years ago in, in Xavier's college, I then started hand painting posters and putting them up in the college. And really the posters just said together, we can make a difference. And so then I started recruiting um, uh, college students from Xavier's and I said, I have no money to pay you, um, but you only need to come in two or three hours a week to teach and, and I will organize the space and I will organize the kids. And, and a few sort of brave college students put their hands up and said, okay, we're, we're up for the challenge. Um, we'll be the teachers. And so really Akanksha started with that idea. Um, there are thousands of, of college students in the country that have immense potential and time to be able to teach. There are hundreds and thousands and millions of children that want to be educated. There are available spaces all over our country um, that we can leverage as teaching spaces. Can we just bring them together? And so my belief right from the beginning was we actually have the resources um, to solve our country's biggest problems. We just need to ask ourselves, do we have the will to do it? Um, so sorry, that was a bit of a rambling answer, but that's that's how Akanksha started off. Wonderful. So, you know, like you said uh, right now, it's very important what you mentioned just now that you started volunteering at a very young age. You know, you said you had love for, you were fond of animals, you loved animals, you wanted to volunteer in whatever capacity you just mentioned. So, and you said that all the youth were just uh, sitting around, they wanted to, so do you think, you know, the fact that you started volunteering very early in life and the importance of doing that is uh, to build empathy and compassion in whatever little way that the youth and youngsters can do in our country, in their surroundings, by just taking that first step 
and also the parents allowing them to do that, you know, go out and volunteer. I think what is, what do you feel? Is that very important because you did it? Yeah. I think it's so important, Tina. I started volunteering when I was 12 years old. And I think those were some of the most formative experiences of my life. I do think for young people today, I mean, the generation today is way ahead in terms of social consciousness than, and, and, and what, what they're already doing than my generation was. You know, at that time, people looked at me like I was crazy when I wanted to come back from the US, leave a good college to come to India to work um, in communities. So I, I think we've progressed a lot. Um, but at the same time, I just think like nothing replaces starting on the ground itself. You know, I, I, I remember a, an interesting uh, time when uh, we were all first five years of Akanksha, we were all volunteers. We had no paid staff. And I remember one day a volunteer went, brand new volunteer, went into the community and came back and she was sort of in tears. And, and she said, Shaheen, she said, you know, um, for years I've been reading the statistics and I've known the problem. But today I know Babu and I know Seema and I know Jyoti. And that has made all the difference. So I think the power of volunteering is in the human connection. It takes the sort of mega big problems that we know our, our country faces um, and, it, and it helps you see how it impacts a single human life and how important that is. True, that is very, very important. Thanks so much. I think that's very, very you know inspiring for most youngsters listening to start volunteering. and even though some of them are already doing it, is to take it one step further ahead and impact as many kids and problems around them. So, uh, you know, I just want to ask you, both the organizations you founded, you know, Akansha as well as TFI, have become such strong brands outside the social sector as well, you know. So over the last few years, uh, Teach for India has become one of the most well-known nonprofits in India with with a far-reaching impact. Could you tell us, you know, a little bit about your approach and, uh, you know, some of the challenges you faced to uh, growing the organization, especially, you know, in the context of some insights for uh, organizations that right now want to transition from small scale to one with a national footprint? Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll just explain a little bit of the approach and the model first. So Akansha was really um, a series of schools um, and, and we run schools in partnership with the government and we say, look, with the same profile of children and pretty much with the same resources, can we shift outcomes fundamentally? Can we give kids a truly holistic education that can unleash their potential? So that's the Akansha model. The Teach for India model is a little bit different, very similar vision that we need to give every child in the country an excellent education. But the model is a little bit of a multiplier model. So the, the way we want to reach there is to build um, really a movement of leaders. And so it, it's interesting, my first thought when you said power of one was a big learning for me over time is that the perhaps the greatest power of one is understanding how limited the power of one is, right? Like I think today it's the power of all of us together and unleashing and tapping into that that makes such um, such a, a, a huge, huge difference. So with Teach for India, the idea is, can we build a movement of young people, people who may not have thought of otherwise going into education and can they work collectively specifically to end educational inequity? And can they work at all levels of the system? Um, so we run a two-year fellowship where they teach full-time for two years. But then the idea is after the two years, they may choose to stay in the classroom. They may choose to lead a school. They may choose to work in education policy. They may choose to rewrite textbooks. They work at multiple levels, but they're, they're working to ensure that all children get an excellent education. So that's the, the approach. Um, challenges, Tina, have been many. I could spend like the entire time we have together just listing out the challenges. I think, you know, when you're a young entrepreneur, there are 
there are challenges of, I mean, mainly yourself. Like, I mean, there's just so much you need to learn and so much you need to do and you're making so many mistakes and you keep falling. Um, so, so I think lots of challenges when, when you're at a stage, as you said, where you have an established model, you feel like it has the potential to scale. Then you have the inevitable challenges of where do I find the funding and how do I work with the government and how do I found, find outstanding people um, to work uh, within the organization. So there are many, many challenges. Having said that, for me personally, and I think I would speak on behalf of my team as well, the greatest challenges have not been the org challenges. The greatest challenges have been the emotional difficulty of working with children who live in poverty. Um, and I think those are things that you may become a little bit more equipped over time to deal with them, but not much more. Um, what do you do? I mean, last year we saw this so clearly with the pandemic, the kinds of issues and challenges that our children face. Um, but even pre-pandemic, you have kids coming into our classrooms who've got a four-year, five-year learning gap. You have kids who are getting abused. You have kids whose parents are unemployed. Like the emotional trauma of dealing with that and knowing that that is the work day in and day out has been, I think, the most, the most challenging. And I'll, I'll just share one more sort of learning along the way. And I, I'm using the word learning because I don't think any of this is is learned yet, but it's all process of learning. Um, I think just shifting the way that I've seen challenges over time has been very, very powerful. And saying if we're, if we're really in the business at Teach for India of building leadership, our own leadership, our fellows' leadership, our students' leadership, um, then it, it's just going to be like, a slow process, you know, three steps forward, two steps back. And we just need to keep working, looking inside and, and keep moving on. Yeah, I guess you're right. It's just a process of learning and moving on and moving on, you know. So, yeah, so moving on, Saloni, can I request you to please continue the session forward? Thank you so much, Saloni. Sure. Sure. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Shaheen, I also wanted to ask uh, if there was any, you know, striking experience in your childhood that um, that kind of moved your heart so much that you, you know, sometimes you you do have an uh, things around you that kind of uh, push you into a, a particular direction. But then there might be some story or some really strong experience that you know you decided, no, this is what I want to do. This is the direction that my life um, should take. So it, was there some kind of uh, experience like that that you had in your childhood or early years? Yeah. I mean, for me, for me, there was there was a moment that I took the decision, but I don't think there was a single experience. I think the the best way I would answer that question, Saloni, is I, I had the opportunity to see a lot of contrast, and I think the contrast is what moved me. Um, so I grew up with a lot of privilege. Um, I was able to do whatever I wanted as a child. I had a lot of emotional support. I had financial support. I was able to go to good schools. And I think the contrast of trips back to India um, and trying to get into the field and seeing and talking to children and un understanding the difference in opportunity, um, that to me very early on started feeling very, very unfair because I would keep asking myself, but why? what have I done to deserve this privilege? Mm -hmm. And the only answer I could really come up with eventually was nothing. Like someone flipped a coin and I got lucky, right? Um, and I, I began to see very early on that there's no difference at all amongst children, but the difference of opportunity and the skew in opportunity makes all the difference to their life outcomes. Um, and so that idea very early on felt very powerful. So I, I think, again, it was the contrast going back and forth. You know, I was in a, in a private school 
in Greenwich, Connecticut in the US where um, for, for their 16th birthday, my classmates were not talking about whether they would get a car. They were talking about which car they would get. And then I would come to India and I would walk into communities and I would see children demonstrate such compassion and courage and bravery with so little in my own way of thinking at the time. Over time, I've come to realize that, uh, that it's much more nuanced than that. But that, that was my thinking at the time. Okay. That's uh, amazing because like you said, uh, privilege also kind of sometimes desensitizes you and it kind of, uh, many times we've seen that it gives you a sense of entitlement and disconnect, but it's so wonderful that it moved your heart in this way and because of which so many thousands of children today are uh, benefiting from that. So amazing. Um, Moving further, I would like to know that, you know, being a woman would have had an impact on your journey, whether positive or otherwise. Um, you know, we have fixed ideas uh, in, you have seen so many different contexts, but your particular family may have had certain ideas. Um, then when you started working, then as a woman uh, in that field may have had certain uh, experiences or opportunities, disadvantages. And then as a, you know, a lot of us uh, go through this, that as a, um, as a spouse, as a parent, um, you know, that whole dimension gets added to our life. And then how, how do you kind of uh, manage with all this? So have there been any challenges as a woman in your journey and how you have uh, kind of dealt with that? Yeah, thanks, Saloni. And I, I... I answer and I, I, I feel just so blessed to be able to answer the answer that I'm, I'm going to give you because I actually think um, I was born into a family that was extremely empowering and understood the power and potential of, of girls. Um, I felt very equal to my brother growing up. Um, I felt I had all, all, all kinds of, of opportunities and I, I grew up thinking of myself less as a girl and more as a human being because of that. So I, I feel very blessed. Similarly, coming to India and with my work and my journey as well, I, I feel I've just been one of those lucky few. I don't, I cannot point to times where um, my gender has come in the way um, of me uh, becoming day by day sort of the, the person and the leader that I want to be. Having said that, two things sort of stand out to me as you ask that question. Um, one is I, I have raised two daughters um, as a single mother, um, and that, that it has not been easy um, along with <laughs> organizations. And so often when I say our children, people stop me and they say, wait, are you talking about your children at home? Are you talking about your children at Teach for India? Um, and so there's been a a constant for many years, ab absolute like tug of war um, in saying when I was at work, there was guilt around not spending enough time at home. When I was at home, guilt around like, you know, how do I evaluate the need to go to a birthday party with my own child with the need to run into a community for potentially a much more serious problem impacting one of my kids at work. So, so that I think was a, a real journey and one I'm sure a lot of people on this call also have faced in, in different ways. At, at some point I just sat down, looked in the mirror and said like guilt is just not helpful. It's not helping, like it's not helping me, it's not helping my kids, it's not helping work. And I think, you know, uh, um, my very wise mentor, um, one of my many, uh, Anu Aga, who served as the, the chair of our board for many years as well and really has built Teach for India and Akanksha alongside me, she sat down with me one day very sternly and she said, you know, you are not a superwoman. And she said, stop thinking that you are. And it was, it was possibly like one of the top five best bits of advice I've ever got because I realized that's exactly what I was trying to be. I was trying to project to the world that like I'm, I can be, you know, a great mother and I can be great at work and actually no, it's just a constant tug of war and sometimes it, it gets off balance and then you bring it back. So that's one thought. My, 
my second thought is, as you ask that question, my heart just goes out to the, the girls we serve at Teach for India and Akanksha. And I think my biggest struggles with women empowerment have been in how to really help uh, the girls that we've served with, as you can imagine, just every single issue confronting um, girls under the sun. And so those, those have been the really difficult things. What do you do when you know your 15 year old student calls you and has been raped and is pregnant and doesn't know what to do? And what do you do when um, you know a mother of your child is getting very badly beaten up? And um, you know, I remember one of my earliest and most traumatic experiences. Saloni, are you able to hear me? Yes. yes. I think your screen is frozen. Okay, great. I was, I was just sharing one, one incident that came to mind when I was a very young teacher at, had first started Akanksha. And I had two children uh, in the same classroom. They both were about eight years old and they were best friends. And one day um, they got into a, their mothers got into a fight and one of the mothers poured gasoline on the other mother and, and set her on fire. And she passed away in front of the girl's eyes. And so overnight, one girl had lost her mother and one girl's mother was imprisoned for life. And these two girls were best friends. And I remember thinking like, when our country is dealing with these kinds of problems, um, how do we help our children make sense? of a world where, where this is the kind of thing they are, are witnessing. So, you know, I may have had small issues as a woman here and there, but I think that the real struggles and challenges have been with the girls and women that I've worked with. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, one is that your daughters must be at you and how you try to life goes out of balance and then you bring it back are you able to hear me Saloni your voice is breaking up a little bit uh, can you hear me yes can you just repeat the question yeah can you hear me now yes yes uh, two daughters hmm. must be observing you and uh, I'm sure they must also be learning from you as how you are trying to balance uh, your uh, work and home. And uh, I'm sure they must be really proud of you and uh, learning a lot from you as well. <laughs> and uh, so the other thing I wanted to uh, further ask on this question is that, so in your organization, as you said, the girls that you work with, or as you say, you serve, um, is there any particular uh, of, uh, try to empower or try to give them some particular kind of more insight or training or something? Do you like what do you really do to change the patterns of thinking or the behavior that they have grown up with? Yeah. I mean, so I was firstly smiling, Saloni, when you were asking about my daughters, because I, it's very hard to know what, what they think um, of what I, I do. And I'm sure they've gone through their own, their own journey with it. I have a 22 year old, she's going to be 22 tomorrow, um, who, who I think has imbibed a lot from the work that I've done and, and is building that a lot into um, her life. Um, and then I have a 17 year old who's on the other extreme right now. Um, and and I, at some point, I hope some of those seeds go in. So you never know what's going to happen with your kids. Um, the, the question around uh, what do we do to empower our girls? Um, actually, Saloni, we have taken an approach that actually a lot of the, the reasons why um, girls struggle so much are a function of the world created by men. And so it is, it's equally important, we feel, um, to educate our boys and our girls. Um, one of the things we think a lot about is, is what is education? And I think this is where there's a lot of synergy with um, all of you at Oasis and, and, and how you see education. But we really believe that 
the right kind of education grows human beings that will treat each other with love and with respect and with compassion. Um, and so there's a lot of emphasis that Teach for India to not just think of education as content and academics um, and not just about you know, an education for exams to get a job, but an education that focuses on self, but equally focuses on others. So how am I with others um, in my world? How do I treat others? How do I unleash others' potential? And how can I, I use my education today, not just in the future, to make the world and the country a little bit better? Yes, I think that is a very important point that you're making that uh, in empowering girls, it is not necessary that we do something for the girls, but we actually, uh, you know, focus even on the boys or the men. And that's how the holistic change in the mindset would uh, happen. I think that's a very important point that you're making. So moving on from there, <laughs> so like you said earlier, uh, you are a learning person, learning the learning continues, you are an evolving person. And uh, somebody who goes through such a journey, such a journey of the heart is always, I, I am sure, a learner, lifelong learner. So um, can you share some of the, you know, what you perceive as mistakes that might have been made on the way, um, knowingly, unknowingly, and what are the insights or the learnings that Sometimes it's good we made some mistakes because they give us a lot of uh, insight. So would you like to talk about that a bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, my mind is buzzing. There, there's so many. <laughs> I mean, I feel like every two years, um, it, it's almost like if you were to do an interview with every with somebody, the same person every two years, you'd almost think that you were talking to a different person. So I think my life has been a lot about that. And, you know, the, the first immediate thing that came to mind as you asked the question was, um, was shifting from really perhaps a place of a lot more ego um, in feeling like, like I can change the world, you know, like that's how I was as an 18 year old. I was like looking for that one thing that would change the world. And I really believe that I could change it. And I think over time, um, I really went from, no, the world's maybe too big a place. Maybe I can change the country and then no, not the country, maybe the city, no. Mom. And today, like, I know that I can't even change my own two daughters at home. Um, the only thing I can really do is look inside um, and, and change myself. And that too, slowly, one step at a time with a lot of work and a lot of gentleness as well on the, on the journey. So. I think that was one big learning, the shift for, for like external shifts to saying the shifts need to be more internal. I think the second was just a space of growing and understanding like the value of love as today for me, just the most important and, and most like all encompassing value uh, in the world, right? I, I feel like when we love and we start with self-love, whatever, with all my flaws, like, can I accept and love who I am today? Can I love the people around me? Can I love the work I do? Can I love the country? Like when we love, I feel we care for something and we do whatever it takes. And so for me, the discovery over time of saying like, it's not about being right. I think as a younger person, my mind was a lot more like black and white. There is a right and wrong. And I was, you know, I remember as a, as a 19 year old, when um, my kids' communities would get demolished and like literally bulldozers would come to the slum and knock these communities down. And my children just wouldn't have a home literally within a few minutes. And there was no advance notice. Sometimes they did it in the summer vacation. So kids were not even in the city when it happened. And I remember like, just being so angry and like running from like government office to government office. And, um, you know, so I guess another big shift, Saloni, is just the shift from anger to saying like, maybe love is a slower approach, but it's like the approach I want to be following. You know, it's slower, it's, but it's going to be more sustainable. Um, 
and, and I believe it's going to be more powerful over time. Um, and then the last one I'll, I'll share is I, I think, again, I, I wouldn't constitute it as a mistake, but my own shift in understanding what education can be has also been a massive evolution of learning. And I think, you know, the, the, the question I have asked myself every year for the last 30 years is like, what do my children need? What do my children need? And can I deepen my understanding of this and continue to evolve my understanding of this? And so I think really being at a space today where I can say with confidence that education, like kids come to school to develop the skills and values to change the world. They don't come to school to, to complete exams or to be graded and to think uh, equate their self-worth with a 96 versus a, a 94. Um, education is very, very, very powerful and it's very whole um, and it's very broad and it's very deep. I think that understanding of what education is and its power has also evolved a lot over time. Okay, fantastic. Thank you for sharing these because yes, as you said, uh, it's something that, uh, you know, something changes on the outside and then that it creates some changes within you. And then again, you try to do something different on the outside. So I think it's a, it's a cycle, cyclical process, uh, which I'm sure that's what you're trying to say, how the internal and the external journey are uh, connected. Okay.